Do you all remember Octomom, Nadi Solomon, 2009? I am sure, unless you were living on some remote planet, that you are familiar with Octomom, which is what the tabloid news and mainstream media dubbed this mom of octuplets. And the way that they portrayed her in the media, honestly, is probably subject enough to have an entire video dedicated to itself. But today, we're not talking about the media framing this mother as unstable or a danger to her children or psychiatrically c complex and worrisome. We're talking about the real villain of this story, her corrupt fertility doctor, Dr. Kamrava. So please come with me. This story is unlike anything you have ever experienced. I promise you will leave having to pick your job off the floor. Let's understand the topic at hand here, okay? Dr. Kamrava first met Nadia Solman in 1997, and they were discussing at that time sex selection for her intended future pregnancy. When she met with him in 1997 for the first time, she was 21, and she had had a first trimester miscarriage, I think at 19 years old. She had been taking Clomid and had not gotten pregnant with that. So it sounds like they performed an artificial insemination in 1998, and she did not end up getting pregnant. She told him at that time, I want to have a big family. I want like 10 children. And she said, nothing's gonna change my mind. I want a large family. Great, you know, I don't think I'm the one to decide how big somebody's family gets to be. So in April 99, she agreed to undergo her first IVF procedure with uh, Dr. Kamrava. He asked her at the time if she would consider multifetal reduction in case that she had too many implant, and apparently she said yes. And this is all from when he had his license revoked. April 18th, 1999 is the first stem cycle that she did with gonadotropins. These are injectable medications that lead to creation of oocytes. So like when you ovulate each month, you have one ovulation site, maybe two. And when you give people medication, instead of creating one, they create a lot. And you get those oocytes to the point where they are big enough where they could all ovulate, but you don't want them to ovulate because you're going to go in with the needle like we showed you earlier and aspirate that and keep them. He described her as intelligent and knowledgeable, which is wildly different than how the media presented her. Now, I do wanna say, that this was a different time in IVF. So now single embryo transfer is the standard that places like the Society for Reproductive Medicine, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, ASRM, would recommend a single embryo transfer. That's generally the goal. But at the time, I don't think that was really standard. It certainly wasn't standard to do a whole lot more than that. With each embryo that implants, you're increasing the risk with the pregnancy, right? So you don't wanna transfer 10 embryos and end up with 10 babies in the uterus because the chances of even some of those making it far enough along to be healthy to go home is low. You're increasing the risk of not only every pregnancy complication under the moon, but particularly of losing all or some of those babies before viability. So on Page six of that document that we're looking at, there is a quote that said, Kamrava did not think he could refuse to transfer less embryos than those to which Solman would agree because he believed at the time that the ultimate decision should be largely driven by the patient's wishes. Now, I have an issue with this because I think this is the way that he kind of tried to make himself look good in this discussion. So what he's saying here is, she told me she wanted to transfer however many they end up transferring, which we will talk about. And he was like, well, I can't tell her no, I gotta do what she wants because autonomy, but that's not how autonomy works, right? I am not going to go, for example, and sit down with a patient and be like, hi, I know you're having heavy periods and we have tried nothing else and I haven't you know, talked to you about any of the options, but, if you want me to take out your uterus, your ovaries, and your tubes at 16 because of your heavy periods, then I'll, I'll just do that because you have autonomy. That's not how this works, right? And also, you are not obligated to do something just because somebody says that that's what they want. If somebody comes to me and says, I want you to do a tummy tuck when you do my C-section, I'm not gonna go, oh yeah, you know what? Autonomy, am I right? Because that's insane. <laughs> like, that's, I, that is not how this works. So sometimes because of how 
medicine and business mix. IVS success rates are a really important part of how people decide what fertility clinic to go to. And for the most part in the United States, fertility clinics are a cash business not typically covered by insurance. That's changing a little bit now, but for the most part, especially in 99. And so if you have a low success rate one year, then you are going to be motivated to do things that increase that success rate. Well, transferring a whole ton of embryos increases the chances that one of them will implant. And so he's motivated to do that. One, you make more money. And two, it helps your success rate. And then if he's already counseled her that like, oh, if we, you know, if we end up with 10, will you do selective reduction? And she says, yes. Well, great. Now you're off the hook, right? Because nobody will ever know that we transferred 10. If all of them take, we'll just get rid of some of them. But, but the problem becomes if somebody, you know, says, yeah, transfer however many, and then they don't actually go through with the selective reduction that they apparently had said, I don't know, she probably would say that this is not actually what she said because to my understanding, one of the reasons that she wanted to transfer a lot is because she didn't want to destroy them because she felt morally opposed to that. So I don't actually know if she did say that. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, let me tell you something. All right. Let me tell you something, let me tell you something. When you do IVF in someone who's 21, 22, 23, you're going to get quite a few embryos most of the time. So a lot of times you will have I don't know, 10 or 15 embryos, depending on the situation. And then you'll transfer one or two and freeze the rest. And then if they want to have another baby later on, then you'll transfer one or two then, one or two then, one or two then. Okay, so instead of doing that, over the next nine years from April 1999, when they did the first stem cycle to June 2008, these are the cycles that they went through, okay? May 1999, he transferred six embryos. She ended up having an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube that they removed. September 99 and July 2000, she had two more ovarian stem cycles that were canceled. Now, the reasons behind canceling a stem cycle would be either overstimulation or you don't think it's working or you ovulated before you could go in and do the retrieval, there's many reasons. Okay, so August 2000, this is her fourth cycle with him. And remember, in the first one, they transferred six and she ended up with an ectopic pregnancy. So she has a stem cycle in August of 2000. Kamrava has five blastocyst embryos that they end up transferring and luckily she gets pregnant with one single baby. May 20th, 2001, first baby, Elijah, born in May of 2001, okay? June, July, August, September, four months postpartum, he's doing another stem cycle. At this point now, it's September 2001, and she has had four stem cycles and a baby. Now she's on the fifth stem cycle, and then in October of 2001, they transfer five more, five more, five, five more, four months postpartum, okay? She gets pregnant, another singleton. Great, awesome. Everybody feels like, hey, look, we're doing everything right. We keep getting pregnant with one singleton. So October 2002, July, August, September, October, we are 12 weeks postpartum, my friends. We're gonna do, what should we do? Anybody guess? What should we, I think we should, you know, rest. We finally have a three or four month old who might sleep a few hours at night. But no, we should do another stem cycle with Dr. Kamrava because I, I can't see anything wrong with that. Now, to be clear, I don't think that the patient should have known that there was something wrong with that, but this is medical malpractice and that is for sure. So October, 2002, 12 weeks postpartum-ish, she has a, another, her sixth stem cycle. And in December of 2002, again, just a mere months after her second baby is born, she transfers four more and gets pregnant with a singleton. That baby is going to result in Joshua, who's born August 20th of 2003. So we've had six stem cycles, three singleton pregnancies, all delivered between May 2001 and August 2003. We haven't even gotten to the octuplets yet. <laughs> yeah, so 2003 was the third baby and then there was a break here, which I'm only assuming was because Nadia was like, this is a lot, I can't do this. In June of 2004, so less than a year after the baby was born, she wanted twins. He said, not recommended, but still transferred four embryos because why not? Uh, she gets pregnant with a singleton. This will be her fourth baby. So seven stem cycles, 
four babies in four years. I'm speechless. I just, what? I also want to bring attention to the fact that I don't know how many embryos are frozen at this point, but going through this many IVF cycles and not transferring frozen embryo embryos is bizarro land. Like, I don't understand why he keeps doing fresh cycles, why he keeps doing stems. I just, I can't, I just, I'm having trouble even reading through this because it is so out of control. Why is it dangerous to do repeated stem cycles? Well, mainly because stem cycles themselves carry a risk. You can get hyperstimulation, which can be life-threatening in certain situations, particularly if you're doing this with like higher doses of medications. And then the procedure itself, like going in with a needle, although it's relatively safe most of the time, there are risks to it. So anytime you're doing additional procedures, especially when you don't have to, you are incurring unnecessary risk. And it just keeps building up to, you know, each time it happens, it's more and more risk. It's wild. So she comes in October 2005, has her eighth sim cycle, gets uh three transferred and ends up with what is called a biochemical pregnancy. This is basically where you had like an embryo that probably just briefly implanted. There was a surge of HCG, which is the pregnancy hormone that we check for, but it didn't even last long enough to officially establish a pregnancy or like see anything in the uterus. And then you have a period and yeah, it's technically a super, super early miscarriage. November, 2005, ninth ovarian stem cycle because why would you just transfer any of the frozen ones and they ended up canceling that halfway through december 2005 no breaks no breaks we are just stem 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 baby baby stem baby baby stem yeah january 2006 after the 10th stem cycle in december 2005 they transfer six embryos and she gets pregnant with the babies number five and six, which are twins. Now, to be clear, I don't have a problem with her having a big family. I have a problem with having all of these fresh stem cycles, presumably when all of these frozen embryos are existing somewhere back here. Calissa and Caleb are born October 2nd, 2006. February 2007, all right? October, November, December, January, February, four months, again, postpartum we're doing another stem cycle. With this all started, first baby Elijah born in 2001. We're now in October, 2006. We've had six babies, 10 stem cycles, four months later, and we're on our 11th stem cycle. Like, how did he not think this is gonna get reviewed and be called malpractic? Like, the fact that he didn't go, obviously someone's gonna take away my license is mind blowing. <laughs> like. What is happening? So February 2007, we're on with our 11th stem cycle. And March 2007, we're gonna transfer six embryos. <laughs> and and we didn't get pregnant. And Dr. Kumrava tells her, you're premenopausal, which is a weird thing to say in general because all of us who are not menopausal are premenopausal. That would just be before we go through menopause. But also she's very clearly getting embryos at all of her stem cycles and lots of embryos at that. So you're not menopausal, that's insane. She's continuing to get eggs when she does the retrievals. So October, 2007, she has her 12th stimulation cycle. And, and during that cycle, they froze eight embryos for a total embryo count of 29 frozen embryos, okay? We've done our 12th cycle. And as I alluded to earlier, we were not in fact just transferring all of them. We were freezing them, 29 of them, in fact. Yep, okay, so it's October, 2007. We've been at this for approximately seven years and 12 cycles. We have frozen 29 embryos and given birth to six babies. I don't even know what to say at this point. What is happening? Let me explain how this should work. You should have one stem cycle where if you're lucky, you get 10 healthy embryos, okay? You transfer one and you freeze nine. And then after that baby's born, you have a period of time and you go, you know what? I really hate sleeping. I think we should do this again. Let's transfer one or two of our frozen embryos, preferably one. So you have the doctor, get your uterus ready and take some medicine and then they fall out your frosty little embryos and transfer them into your uterus. And you get pregnant with one happy baby. And the world is good. You still have, I don't know, 
five frozen embryos that look healthy because a couple of them didn't make the freezing process and we lost a couple. But no, in Dr. Kamrava land, you have 12 stem cycles over eight years and transfer this many embryos in every cycle. And then you freeze a whole lot too. So he's making money, a lot of money on every stem cycle, on every aspiration procedure and on the storage of all of these frozen embryos. 12 cycles, eight years, six live babies. In January of 2008, with 29 frozen embryos, more than enough for a whole lot of people to make a family, a big family. Lots of people could make a family with that many embryos, but no, we're going to do another stem cycle in January of 2008. 13th stem cycle occurs. And you know what they did for that? They transferred eight embryos and she didn't get pregnant. Oh my gosh, I need to calm down. <laughs> what happens when you're gonna be at risk of losing your medical license is you have to go defend like what's been going on like to the medical board. And you have like a moment and you get to like say your piece about whatever it is. So he's like to his peers, which is the medical board, other doctors, he's explaining, you know, why would I transfer an exorbitant amount of embryos, eight of them? He says, well, she had debilitating ovaries. She had a history of failed IVF over the years. Yeah, I guess so, except also she's had six babies. All the successful transfers had resulted in a single baby with the exception of one set of twins. So that's how he justified all of the, all of the embryos that they were going to transfer. All embryonic transfers for Nadia beginning in 2004, respondent considered the guidelines on the number of embryos to transfer an IVF procedure set forth by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine but understood those guidelines to be flexible depending on the factual circumstances presented in each patient's case. These are flexible. Guidelines are flexible, but not this flexible. Like a pipe cleaner is flexible, you know? But Jello, this is Jello interpretation of guidelines. June 2008. Do we transfer some of the 29 frozen ones? Why would we do that? She had a 14th stem cycle in June of 2008. And in July of 2008, she said, I want to transfer all of them. And he said, all right, great. We'll transfer 12. And she, this is when she got pregnant with her octuplets. What he says at this point is she insisted on transferring 12. This is a really confusing chain of events because there is Nadia's story and there is what's in this documentation of him losing his license. And there is how the media spins it. So it's really hard to get like to the full, like, what actually happened. Because I don't think that I would even trust the medical documentation in this situation because he obviously is scum. Like, why would we trust that he's documenting accurately? But she apparently had frozen embryos that she didn't want to destroy and requested that they all be transferred. However, her side of the story says that I thought that there were six. He told me I had six. And it wasn't until the later medical review that we found out that Nadia found out that there were actually 29. So she thought there were six and she said, I want to transfer them all. Well, that makes sense, right? If she says, I want to transfer them all, there's six. That's how many he's been transferring all along, six or even more in some situations, and it's all been fine. So yeah, of course she would say that, but she didn't know how many there were and he didn't correct her. Bizarrely, instead of transferring what she thought were the six frozen ones that they had, he did a fresh cycle and transferred 12. He's put her in a situation where obviously she can't use all of those embryos and now she's pregnant with octuplets and her only goal with this last pregnancy was to use up the six she thought were frozen. The TLDR of this is nine years, 14 stem cycles, 10 transfers, 29 frozen embryos, 47 fresh embryos transferred, four singleton pregnancies delivered, a twin pregnancy delivered, and now octuplet pregnancy. I don't even, I don't even have that many fingers, look. Okay, so expert testimony came in to discuss the case and the two experts uh, independently disagreed on whether transferring six embryos at the time would have been outside of the standard of care, but they both independently agreed that eight embryos and 12 embryos was absolutely egregious and outside of standard of care. They also disagreed on whether the physician should consider the mother's other children, how many gonadotropins is too many, and whether or not using the 29 embryos that were frozen uh, or doing new cycles was a good or bad idea. 
I, however, do not think that that is a point of disagreement because frozen embryo transfer absolutely should be undertaken before fresh cycles, particularly when you have somebody who does not want to destroy embryos. That is like an ethical clear line. If you have someone who does not want to freeze embryos forever or destroy them or whatever, they feel morally opposed to that, then under absolutely no circumstances should you ever do a stem cycle unless they have no frozen embryos, period. By 2010, Kamrava is facing this medical license being revoked. So what we're going through now, this document, and he tried to defend himself in an interview with ABC News. Uh, so let's watch that video. How has this been for you personally? Well, it's been uh, very traumatic. Uh, oh, has it? Has it been traumatic for you? Oh, I'm sorry. You know who it's been traumatic for? Nadia. And us. We had to read this. This was traumatic. And also, your patient was treated like by the media. We are trying to help Mother Nature one little push or a little nudge, you know, to make it go the next step. They were talking about... That is not a little nudge, my friend. That was like you took the bus and you put it in high gear and you stood Mother Nature right on the edge of a very big mountain and then you press the gas with no slowing down until Mother Nature flew off of the mountain. You did not nudge Mother Nature. That is not a nudge. But a new technique that Dr. Kamrava had invented, one that has never been clinically tested, which allows him to see inside the patient's uterus as he implants the embryos. Okay, no wonder I had never heard of that. He made it up. <laughs> It was amazing. It was absolutely, to it was totally different than the old fashioned in vitro because you see it through the monitor, you see it on ultrasound, and he knows exactly which area to pinpoint. She doesn't feel like this anymore. Two of those embryos presumably split, making Suleiman the Octomom. Did you catch what they just said? He transferred six, and that's how she became the Octomom. But that wasn't what happened, right? We just went through the medical records from him losing his license. He transferred 12. So not only was he being not truthful behind the scenes. She thought they transferred six because he told her they transferred six. And it wasn't even until they reviewed the medical records that it actually came out that he transferred 12. Did he say anything in his own defense that was in any way compelling to you? No. <laughs> oh my God, that was so good. Oh, we have to listen to that again. Did he say anything in his own defense that was in any way compelling to you? No. Nothing? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, no. Nothing. <laughs> Dr. Kamrava insists that <laughs> legally one, he has to follow his patient's wishes about what to do with their embryos. Although many of his colleagues disagree with that. Well also, and uh, you didn't, even do that, so <laughs> good try. I've been in practicing uh, for 30 years and uh, I have been of service to the people for 30 years. I've, I've been practicing for 30 years and uh, yeah, I mean, it's honestly shocking I didn't get caught until now. That's what I want the people to know is the oversight from the medical board is a uh, real because I should have been taken out of practice a long time ago. His meeting before the medical board is scheduled for this fall, and he says he is confident he'll be able to convince them to let him stay in business. <laughs> this is Dan Harris in Los Angeles. Oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't think it worked out for you, Dr. Kamrava. You know, uh, I hate to spoil the dream for you, but I do not think it's going to work out. I don't think they're, they're going to let you keep your license. Um, but we shall see, shall we see? Let's see. Uh, June 1st, 2011. Sorry, Dr. Kamrava, you, you no longer have a license to practice medicine. They have removed his medical license and here is the reasoning that they gave for that. Transferring eight embryos and then 12 at once in 2008 was gross negligence. I would argue it is more than that, but sure. 
uh, not referring her to mental health care was not negligence. I kind of hinted at this earlier that I don't really think that not referring to mental health care is not negligence, but it's a bit wonky to assume that just because somebody wants to have a lot of children, they need mental health care. Like, I think this is a really important point in this discussion because the media at the time where all of this happened really made her out to be just like wildly unstable. Octo mom. I look at you and I see an extremely self-absorbed person. She's already identified herself as a dangerous woman. She's an unfit mother. Are these children really safe in their own home? And I remember really buying into that because that's what was all over the media, right? It was everywhere and everywhere just really demonized her as being like a leech off the system and like unstable and stupid and like uh, all these things, right? I've watched a lot of interviews with her and actually follow her on Instagram now and have read a lot about how she, well, her own words kind of reflecting on this. And it's really quite remarkable uh, how horrible the media made her look. Revocation of Kamrava's certificate is necessary to protect the public. And that was what they did. So they protected the public by taking away his medical license. I hope that I am never in a situation where I need to receive some kind of information from the medical board where they need to take a practicing certificate from me or my license from me in order to protect the public. And uh, I promise I won't transfer 12 embryos into anybody because that is insane. Now, in all seriousness, we have talked about mega multiples and the exploitation that happens with these families or has happened in the past and continues to happen in some areas. Most of those cases in the, both the mega multiples videos were not from IVF, but this one was, and that's why this one is so unique because having mega multiples from IVF is a situation where it is almost always going to be some form of malpractice. Every pregnancy carries risks and those risks multiply with more and more fetuses as you go over time. The risks of the procedure compound with every time that you have it done. So if you're ever in a position where, yeah, you're being told to transfer 12 embryos uh, when you have 29 frozen, uh, you should just, no thank you.